So I went to the clinic, the Major League Baseball clinic in Chicago. And um, Friday night was the debate between me and Jeff Fry. Saturday was a list of speakers and Sunday was a list of speakers. And I will start off by saying that if I was a paying customer, I would have been really disappointed in the clinic. Um, not one bat was swung, not one ball was hit. It's a hitting clinic. And I understand that uh, people have theories and different things to talk about that maybe the stage with um, audio video equipment is, is good for part of that. And I expected that to be part of it. But I also thought that there would be some balls hit, some bats swung. We were in a big facility. Uh, we weren't in a auditorium. We were in a facility where they had plenty of space, plenty of cages, real big place, big enough that they could set up probably 200 chairs and a stage and still have maybe one third of the room full. Two thirds of the room could have been used for other things. So that was disappointing. Um, I expected maybe to hear some of the major league coaches uh, talk in a cage with a bat and a ball and a tee, maybe some flips, and talk about how they hit the outside pitch or what they do to control their load or how they uh, deal with the slider or uh, a pitch location that's, a tr that's trouble for somebody. And there was none of that. So it was quite disappointing. All right, let's go to the debate. So about a half hour before the debate started, I was informed that the format would be, I get a half hour to introduce myself, who I am, how I got here, what I teach. And then Jeff Fry would get the same half hour. And then we would both get on stage at the same time and we would field questions. And whatever the question would be, I'd give my answer. Jeff would give his answer and then the audience could decide which answer they liked best. So I started my talk by talking about, uh, I grew up in a small town in Iowa, loved the, learned to love the game from my father, uh, played division two baseball, good catcher, not a great hitter. Uh, got married, had a couple of sons and a daughter. And as the sons are playing little league, they're good in the field, but they're not real good hitters. Pretty soon this thing called the internet comes around um, I start studying, I'm reading on the internet at, at daytime and I'm going home and teaching my sons at nighttime, blah, 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 we don't get any better. I finally start to just kind of uh, try to duplicate Barry Bonds' swing. My theory was that if I could make myself look like him, I would feel a stretch or a load or a quickness or something that I didn't know or understand as a player. And sure enough, that's what happened. Taught it to my son, he had a big summer. Um, met David Matranga on the internet and he wanted to know what I had taught my son. I taught it to David. David had his best two years in the minor leagues, uh, but he was 32 years old and the writing was on the wall that he's not gonna get called back to the big leagues. So he retired, became an agent um, from 09 to 16 as he's recruiting talent to their agency. He's sending me video and I'm just a friendly consultant giving him my opinion of the swings. And then that all changed in November of 16 when he invited me to work with Aaron Judge. Worked with him for a week, twice a day for a week in November, twice a day for a week the following January. Went to spring training, tuned him up for three days. And then boom, 2017 season happens. He hits 30 home runs, bats 330 before the All-Star break, wins the home run derby. Uh, hurts himself in the home run derby. Um, can't hold the bat without pain. It affects him. He strikes out a lot for over the next month or so. Finally, he heals. I go to New York and I'm with him for five days in a row, get him tuned up, get him back on track. He hits 15 homers and ends up with 52, sets a rookie record, becomes rookie of the year. So I go through all of that and then I start talking about what I teach, the hand pivot point, the rear leg pivot point, and the stretch between them how that creates what I call launch quickness. And that was the difference in what I learned from Barry Bonds that I didn't have prior to my experience trying to duplicate Barry Bonds. Um, talked about um, 
all you know in a, in a short I had like a half hour and I'm trying to get all this in so I talked about that and how uh, other people come along Scott Kingery Ian Happ and some others and then I started showing video oh no I, I also introduced the uh, uh, told him that I'm sitting on my patio one night in 2018, May I believe it was, my phone rings and it's Manny Ramirez and Manny calls and basically says, I like you teacher man because you're the only one that's ever explained what I did accurately. And then Manny came and worked with me for three days and then he flew me to Fort Lauderdale and I worked with him for four days. Um, then I went and showed video of guys doing what I teach like Aaron and Scott and Ian, and then some of my minor leaguers who are doing really well, Jacob and Chad and Braxton. And then I um, ended up with some, uh, I made a, I, I went to what I called my mission, why I came to do this, and my mission was to explain to these major league hitting coaches that the swing has to be launched from the rear leg all the great players launch from the rear leg and I continually see major league hitters shifting to their front leg before they launch and how that's what's keeping them from reaching their potential. I then showed some side-by-side -side videos of different people who uh, were shifting prior to launch and I'd have them side-by-side -side with a great. Um, I showed a side-by-side -side of Bryce Harper before when he was a leaper, not just a shifter, but a leaper. He used to leap out there and then swing compared to now, his MVP season, his latest MVP season, how he's staying back on his back leg and he's getting barrel dapped and blah, blah, blah. So that's pretty much my presentation. And then I sit down and John Malley then introduces Jeff Fry. And I was told that this is we're, we're supposed to keep from slinging mud as much as we can, so I slung no mud. I did not mention Jeff Fry's name at all in my half hour presentation. Um, the first thing John Malley does is he starts to poo poo my talk, not in a big way, but in a subtle way. Um, he says something like your barrel depth can, can be achieved a lot of different ways, not just with a snap. And I got the feeling that he was trying to be nice about it, but also trying to protect what he believes and trying to discount what I had said. So he introduces Jeff Fry. Jeff gets up on the stage, starts talking about his background, grew up with a single mom and uh, was a pretty good basketball and baseball player. He's a small guy, gets a scholarship to go to junior college. Um, decides that basketball is not his future because all he basically gets to do is shoot free throws at the end of a game and commits to baseball and does well and gets drafted and does well. Um, and then that goes on for about 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. And the last 10 or 15 minutes of his talk, he just attacks me and us, me and the people that I have instructed who are also instructing the high level pattern. So I didn't mention his name at all. I didn't sling a mud, any mud at all. And now for 15 minutes or so, he chooses to sling mud at me. So after his presentation is done, we get on stage and we start to field questions. And I forget what the first question was. I think it was about the rear foot, about uh, the scissor and I answered it accordingly, that I teach what I teach. I teach the high level pattern. I teach the snap and the stretch and fire from the rear leg. And I said, I have some hitters that from doing that, scissor. And I have some hitters that from doing that, don't scissor. And I said, it's not a teach, it's a no teach. It may happen, it may not. Uh, you must teach the important things and don't worry about the rear foot. And I went on to talk about Jim, Jim Tomey's rear foot. I believe he hit 660 homers and his rear foot never even went to his toe. It just kind of everted um, and slid forward a little bit, but never rotated upwards. And then Barry Bonds, whose rear foot actually came across home plate when he followed through. Uh, most people just kind of go up on their toe a little bit. I said for every good hitter I found, there was almost a different foot response for each one, so the rear foot was a no 
no teach for me. Um, Jeff pretty much said nothing again. Uh, he doesn't know anything. By the way, in Jeff's talk, he said that he teaches the fundamentals, and those fundamentals are balance, rhythm, and timing. That's all he said. No details, just balance, rhythm, and timing. As if anybody can stand there with balance and get a little rhythm and time a pitch and be successful. I mean, come on. Uh, I came to a clinic to learn something. I, I could have read that in a book and not learned a thing. Anyway, there were more questions. Um, one of them came up on timing and at this point, I'm a little offended by what John Malley did to me after my half hour. So I had a little teacher man ire going on. Um, so it was, came time to talk about timing. I forget exactly what the question was, but I started talking about my two ball drill that I do out of the, out of the pitching machine, the fastball changeup drill, and how basically to have good timing, you have to learn to uh, create the stretch and fire load and control it such that you're, you're they're there on time for the fastball and you can hold it, not lose it, you can hold it for the off-speed pitch. And that is probably the special thing that I teach and I, the, the, the fastball change-up machine does a real good job on it. So I finished that answer to that question by saying a year ago, it was November of 2020, when a 10-year big leaguer came to my facility and asked me to work with him. He was recommended by Ian Happ. And I put him through this drill and he couldn't hit the ball. He couldn't hit the fastball, he couldn't hit the changeup. He couldn't time either ball. The reason was he was using momentum and not stretch. So I coached him up a little bit and got him to understand how you can stretch and this stretch is controllable and it can snap whenever you want it to and you don't lose control because of momentum. So he had a great session and as he left that day, I, he said, how have I been in the big leagues for 10 years and never known this? That was his words to me as he was leaving and I was delivering those words to the audience to, express, to finish my talk on timing. And after I said the comment, uh, how have I been in the big leagues for 10 years and no one's ever shown me this? I said to the audience, because MLB doesn't know it. And I believe John Malley took offense to that. He said something shortly thereafter. Um, I can't tell you, I can't remember what it was, but it, it led me to believe he was offended by it. Okay. So a little bit later, there's a question about uh, the coil. And Jeff Fry says he doesn't believe in coil. Timing, balance, and rhythm are the only things important. And he starts to explain why he doesn't like coil, and his shoulder would come in like this, and he said, I kind of rotate my shoulder, I can barely see the pitcher. And he didn't, he didn't coil his butt at all. All he did was pull his shoulders in. So I pointed out that you're not coiling, Jeff, you're just kind of rotating your shoulder. So then he coiled, and he still kind of rotated his shoulder. And I said, it would be nice if you knew what I taught before you criticized it. So then I explained to the crowd that when you coil your butt, that action is somewhat merry-go-roundish, but to keep your shoulder from coming in with that merry-go-round, you Ferris wheel your shoulders. So you have a Ferris wheeling shoulder and a merry-go-rounding leg, and that keeps the shoulder from coming in. It doesn't come in like this, it does this move here, and therefore you can see the picture, and you don't have a long around swing. And I, that comment um, was strong, and it embarrassed Judy, and for the first time, I sent off a zinger, the only zinger I sent off, I think, and I said, booyah, because I had been attacked uh, quite a bit by Jeff, and a little bit by John Malley, and I had had enough. And when I made the point, I made sure everybody understood the point. So um, the, debate, the debate went on and on. And I can't remember all the questions. I did get a question about Cole Calhoun. 
if some of you don't know, I worked with Cole Calhoun, I believe it was five sessions in the uh, three in the off season of 2008, uh, before 2018 and two at spring training of 2018. And Cole started the season hot as could be. He hit 360 in spring training, was tearing it up. Opening day, he hit an oppo homer and a double and a single. He had three hits on opening day. And from that day on, he just kind of deteriorated little by little by little by little by little. And um, the long and short of it is, I only had five sessions with him and it, it's probably should have never done it if that's all I was going to get. But I thought the opportunity to work with another pro was worth it. So uh, it ends up Cole was really struggling and the and Angels had to take him off their active rocket roster and put him into spring, uh, uh, the minor leagues to get him to uh, get his swing back. And finally he got his swing back, but it wasn't all that great, but it was, it was better than what he was doing. So anyway, I read a statement that David Matranga had said when someone challenged this concept on Twitter, and I read it to the audience. Well, first of all, I said, I have over 150 hours with, Dar with uh, Aaron Judge. I have, I don't know exactly, but 50, 60, maybe 70 with Scott Kingery. I have 10 with Ian Happ, and I had five with Cole Calhoun. So then I read this, which is uh, Matranga's response on Twitter to someone criticizing me for the, my failure with Cole Calhoun. Here are the facts. Calhoun was in a downward spiral long before he worked with Rich. After working with Rich three times before the 18 spring training, he hit nearly 360 in camp and was killing it. The season started, he hit an opening day bomb, oppo bomb, and was feeling good. Getting work with Rich was tough after the season started and he revered back to old habits. He salvaged his swing back and bounced back with power last season, but a low average. He never paid Rich a dime. That's the truth. Some people on Twitter have accused me of getting paid twenty or $30,000 by Cole Calhoun and ruining his swing. Well, I didn't get paid a dime, number one. And although Cole was interested in changing his swing, we didn't get enough time to work to get it solid and ready for the season. So I'm going to show you a video here shortly of what Cole looked like in spring training and you should be able to see that he's doing what I teach. And then there's another swing in this video is where I found him when he was struggling. Okay, I was called to Anaheim April, I forget, it was early in the season. He had already started well and was deteriorating and I was called to Anaheim to try to help him and this is where I found him. Spring training, Anaheim. Spring training, Anaheim. Spring training, one-legged snap, Anaheim, shift your leg and push your barrel. One-legged snap, push it. Nice snap, push it, okay? So, Cole is absolutely the most fun guy to work with. Um, he was very, he would give you great feedback. If he didn't feel something, he would tell you. And if he did feel something, he'd tell you. And he'd say, Rich, I just can't feel that. Or, man, that was good, whatever. The feedback was really good. From an instructor standpoint, I really like the feedback, good or bad. I need to know what you're feeling. Does it feel right? Does it feel wrong? Uh, and then we can advance from there. So anyway, um, Cole texted me in late April, I think it was, that, hey, I really like and appreciate what you've done, but I've just got to get out there and compete. I'm going to go back to what I used to do just to compete. And I respected that. Um, we didn't have near enough time to get it solidified and so that's what he had to do. Okay, so anybody out there seen the movie Stepford Wives? It's an old movie. I don't know when I saw it and I'm not even a movie goer or a movie watcher but I happened to see this one. It was about the town of Stepford 
and the town men, the men's club, I guess, would take their wives and have their brains removed and some kind of robotic brain put in. And the Stepford wives would say, yes, honey, I love you, honey. Thank you, honey, blah, blah, blah. So there was one dad or one couple that moved to town and the, the husband um, was introduced to the club and the goal was to get his wife to act like all the other wives. And I don't remember the details, but the wife found out about it and resisted it and eventually escaped. This comes to mind because that clinic was the Stepford Hitting Clinic. It was an attempt to get everybody on board with the metrics and analytics nonsense. And I feel like I was the wife that escaped. Um, unbelievable clinic. If I would have spent 200 to go that, I'd been furious. Total waste of time, okay? That being said, the audience was very happy to become Stepford hitters. They hold the speakers in high esteem, not because of what they know, but because of the position they hold. And there was not any good information to be delivered to the audience in terms of the swing and how to help a hitter hit. Assess, measure, they did that a lot. They had no fixes, they had no answers. One last thing, Mark Gokenauer, who's a member of the High Level Pattern uh, Facebook group, him and his son have been to me two or three times. Jordan's a college player in Texas, they're from Houston. Um, Mark asked Jeff a question when we were on stage. He said, Jeff, you talk about teaching the fundamentals of balance, rhythm and timing. Mark says, how do you do that? Simple question. How do you do that? And Jeff stammered and stuttered and had no answer. He could not answer the question. Here's the deal. I don't believe Jeff teaches anyone. Jeff had a playing career. His playing career, his, re his playing resume, way better than mine. But the topic now is what we teach. And I don't believe he has a teaching resume. I think it's empty, it's blank. Um, he constantly would talk about fundamentals of baseball, the fundamentals of baseball. He has a real issue with all the strikeouts. He has an issue with the shift. He has an issue with batting averages being down, blah, blah, blah. Um, the game is a little different right now. The pitching is more dominant than the hitting. The strikeouts are up because of the pitching. It used to be Aroldis Chapman was the only one that threw 100. And now every team has one or two and everybody else is throwing 97. And so the game is different and it's evolving. And guess what? The hitters won't catch up until they start doing what I teach, the high level pattern. When they start buying into launch quickness then they'll buy time, they'll, be, they'll have more time to read the pitch and therefore hit more barrels. Um, one last thing, I, thought, I found it really, really interesting that in Malley's opening comment, he said he holds these clinics for selfish reasons. And initially I thought, yeah, to make money. But that wasn't his point, which is fine. His point was he holds these clinics so that he can learn. In other words, the, the big uh, feel-good theme is you've always got to keep learning. And so John Malley was saying that he holds these clinics so he can continue to learn. Good, fine. Except not one person came up to me and asked questions about what I teach. So really, were they there to learn? Were they there to learn? Not that they had to adopt or buy what I'm selling, but if you're there to learn, don't you ask questions? Don't you, don't you explore, investigate what I'm saying as, and try to figure out why it's been successful for Aaron Judge? Why has it been successful for Scott Kingery? Why has it been successful for Braxton Martinez, who was 
had the best numbers in the uh, Angels minor leagues last year. Okay, so sorry to bother you with the boredom, but I wanted to relate what happened to at the clinic. Uh, I understand the video of the clinic will be for sale. Go ahead and buy it if you want it. Uh, it'll back up everything I just said. Um, I'm not sure what they're going to sell it for, but um, I went and took my shot. I was hoping that I could get an audience of Major League Baseball hitting people and get them to try to understand what I teach. Uh, but that part of the trip was very much a failure. Okay, any questions?